everyone. I would like to call to order, hello, hello, the um, April 5th, 2022 Finance Committee meeting. Carrie, would you please call the roll? Councilor Bell. Here. Here, we have a quorum. Um, first item on the agenda is approval of minutes, the minutes of the March 1st, 2022 Finance Committee. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I've reviewed the minutes and I will make a motion to approve as presented. We have a motion to approve the minutes of the March 1st meeting. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Those have been approved. Here's another chair here if someone needs it. So, um, <clears throat> the next item is public comments. Is there anyone here from the public who wishes to speak? You have three minutes. Please come to the podium, state your name and address. There being none, I will now close the public comments and move on to the agenda. The first item on the agenda is the Winchester Regional Airport Authority update presented by Nick Sabo, Executive Director, and Bill Bellis. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you. We will make the brief, especially me, since uh, Nick is the heart and soul of the airport. Uh, for those who may not know me, I'm Bill Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer. I'm now Chairman of um, the Authority. Gene uh, Fisher, uh, magnanimously agreed to uh, offer that to me and I accept it. Um, that relationship with Gene and all of the jurisdictions of the regional airport is the way it works now. There is spectacular, there are spectacular dynamics within the, uh, do, do I need this? Um, yes. Okay. Probably do. for recording. Okay. Um, the dynamics with on the authority with uh, on the authority are spectacular. We also think, and I don't think we're fooling ourselves, that the dynamics in the community and with organizations because of Nick's efforts are are spectacular. Not the least of which uh, is the participation of people like Phil Milstead, who you all have assigned to the authority. His input. Uh, very discreet and well timed and uh, and very valuable to us. John Everhart, who is your second appointee to the authority, uh, has some fantastic energy in uh, unmanned vehicle um, aviation aeronautic areas, which just starts to take us in a totally different direction, not different, but keeps us up with what's going on. Um, and I guess the, sort of the last thing I would say about where we're headed and then, then I will go to the authority is, um, I don't know when it was that I realized that even while I've been on the authority, we were sort of thinking, ourse thinking of ourselves as an airport. And we ain't thinking that way anymore. There are other things that we can do. We've always talked about the, the, the benefit of an economic development instrument, and sometimes that's nebulous to people who see smaller planes flying around and think it's uh, um, for private aviation, but quite frankly, the, the um, corporate stuff is truly an economic engine. It's just, it's amazing. And, and it's our responsibility, and because I'm responsible to you, it's, it's on me and John to convey uh, as well as we possibly can that specific economic benefit. So to the extent you don't know, that's on me and we, we strive to do that uh, every day and hopefully we're doing a better job of that. Um, we're excited about it. We started to think, ourselves, uh, think of ourselves as a business we are going to be looking at bottom line. We are, and, and we are even now developing um, things that we will present to you that talk about how effective and financially uh, 
beneficial things like the um, uh, the hangar 509 hangar, the old ProJet hangar. That commitment to spend that money, and you all backed it, it as did Frederick County. What that's done for us, and all of that, and I, I don't think I'm overstating it. If it turns out I am, when we present your figures, we are in great shape financially, and and we better be. That's our that's our modus operandi. So we view ourselves now as a business and we're going to grow it in different ways that that only enhances that and if we don't do that you ought to fire me and when appointment time comes up you ought to hold my feet to the fire and it's not just me but we do feel like that cohesiveness on the authority is is a wonderful time we're we're, we're doing well we do need your all support we're trying to minimize that support anytime we come before you to ask for such support Please know in the background, we're not just going to say, here's what we're doing, may we get a check. It's, here's what we're doing, here's what it's going to cost, and we may need a contribution, but, it, but, it, but it's a different animal right now. So having said that and rambling on, which I'm sometimes prone to do, I'm sorry to do that, but uh, I appreciate it. And again, I know who my boss is, you all. And so if you have any questions, if, you, if we're not conveying that to you, uh, I, I feel a, a great sense of responsibility in, in making sure that, that we're doing our job with you guys and spending our money wisely and your money when you're kicking it in. So again, thanks, and I'll turn it over to Nick, who's, who's the heart and soul of the airport. Thank you, Bill. Again, uh, Nick Sabo, Executive Director of the Winchester Regional Airport Authority. Thank you for your time this afternoon to talk through some of these things. Um, the goal for today is to talk through our FY23 budget request as well as a brief overview of some key capital projects that are coming alive this year and also talk about the, the exciting new terminal project that's also going to be really kicking off uh, this, this next fiscal year. Uh, the first slide I had up actually was a video. Um, it's a marketing piece that we did. It's about a four minute video uh, to help explain and tell the story of the airport. Um, oftentimes general aviation facilities like ours um, are, are widely misunderstood about the value that they add to the community and, and this video does a really good job of, of giving broad sketches about some of those benefits to every citizen, even those that never use the airport or never walk on the grounds. Uh, there's inherent benefit to having a, a capable facility like ours and that video does a great job. I want to call attention that we feature a business in there, Blue Ridge AI, it's a city-based business and they fly a small single engine airplane uh, in, in the, in the uh, operations of their business. I just think it's a great story to tell. Uh, starting things off, uh, discussing the operating budget, um, the contributions from the city are down about 53% uh, since fiscal year 19, and, and that's really due to three uh, primary reasons, and we're kind of generalizing here, but one is increased fuel sales. We're, we're taking advantage of some new fuel uh, marketing programs that have uh, increased the volume uh, uplift of some of our current customers and then also have brought in new business uh, folks that have never flown into Winchester before. So that is that is being that has played out over the last few years and now we're reaping the benefits and, and able to, to show that in our bottom line. Uh, second reason is, is stronger rental revenues. Um, uh, back to what Bill said, uh, Hangar 509 is what we call it. That's the large corporate hangar facility that uh, we acquired a couple of years ago. Uh, that is bearing fruit. It's actually beating our pro forma uh, estimates on that. It's really become the foundation and cornerstone of a lot of what we do in terms of business development because it's key infrastructure that an airport like our size, uh, it's almost a must have and so it's, it's performing very well. And then finally would be ne new revenues and uh, the best example of this is the groundbreaking ceremony we had just a couple of weeks ago um, for a private developer. Um, the project is called KOKV Hangers, but this is a private developer uh, that is uh, bearing all the costs of capital development of new high quality hangers and in return we're, we're going to have a, a, a ground lease with them for 40 years. Uh, we're also going to be the beneficiary of uh, new fuel sales and services to those future occupants of those hangers. So uh, all of those factors kind of contribute to this further reduction in our operating budget uh, and we're going to continue that process. Uh, we're also starting to shore up uh, a reserve fund again, which we haven't had for uh, several years, and so we're excited about that. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that in our operating budget, um, you know, our staff and the way we use our funds, uh, it, is, it is very meticulous. Um, of this budget, which in, in the FY23, it's roughly a $2.3 million budget, 
the bulk of that are salaries, merchandise for resale, which is the fuel that we acquire to sell it as a reseller, um, insurance, utilities. If you take all that out, there's less than 2% that's remaining that's in any way, shape, or form discretionary. So we, re we truly punch above our weight class when it comes to managing that operating budget. Uh, the next slide shows a snapshot of our capital budget and just a, a feature of how our capital budget is uh, administered and how we come to the city for requests. Uh, usually the request amount, uh, I don't say it's a worst case scenario, but it's as if every grant that we could be eligible for came, up to, came to fruition and all expenses were incurred in that same year. That's the only way that we really can budget because we've got to show uh, revenue sources in order to even accept grants from the state or the feds. And so that's typically how a request is made to you, but this slide highlights how we rarely, if ever, uh, actually spend all of those and we only come to the city uh, for reimbursements of actual expenses we we don't do as bill mentioned uh, we don't come and ask for a blank check and just receive a cash grant on our capital budget it is all for bona fide capital expenses um, and so when we put this budget together like we've done for this year you know it is grant dri driven we try to forecast ahead about availability of grants sometimes it doesn't always work out uh, a lot of things could happen to affect state and, and federal dollars uh, and it also reflects kind of the multi-year na uh, nature of, of the capital projects that we uh, embark upon. So uh, some of the same revenues that we've requested have just fallen through to the next year. And that's why the request for FY23 looks a lot like the, the one for FY22. It's because it, it relates to a lot of the same projects. Um, we derive, we develop our capital budget um, from our master plan, our airport layout plan, and then of course we work closely with our state and federal partners on the execution of those plans and try to slot in where we can find grant revenues. The next slide just shows kind of if you summed up the operating and capital requests from the city, what the actuals have been in the last uh, four years and then projecting ahead to, to next year. Uh, very similar to FY22, uh, and we, we don't anticipate, again, to spend it all, but it just shows, again, how uh, we are not, in, in fact, collecting 600-plus thousand from the city. It's, it's about 30% uh, of that or so. So where are those revenues going here? In FY23, uh, you can see all the projects that we show under the description with Carry Forward, they, they are already in progress. Um, our FY23 budget has uh, just north of $4 million coming from the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, so we're very appreciative of their investment in our airport. Uh, two grants related to the terminal building that we'll talk about in a second are from the Virginia Department of Aviation. Those do have a slightly larger local share, as we say. And then the remainder Excuse are, me, Nick. Yes, um, please. Can we make the screen a little bigger, please? I'm sorry, it's a bit of an eye chart. Yeah. It's a little bigger. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And so you can see from the columns up top, federal, state, local, and the totals mm -hmm. for each of those projects. Um, so it, it all distills down to that local component that we <coughs> then break out uh, between the jurisdictions of the authority. And I'm proud to mention that uh, even though it's not a significant uh, amount dollar-wise, we, we have uh, Warren County contributing for the first time in 11 years to this budget. So we've worked very hard on that relationship. And um, we've also increased the amount of contribution from Shenandoah County from uh, 2500 to $5,000. So now all of the outlying jurisdictions, as we say, are contributing the same amount. Uh, and we're extremely uh, proud and uh, encouraged by that, that development here this, this year. The next picture shows kind of a snapshot of the airport and kind of where these projects are all going to be taking place. And you can see there's quite a lot of movement. Uh, we are, you know, in, in, in broad strokes, we're moving a taxiway another 100 feet. Uh, we're creating a new apron, which is a parking area for, for aircraft, and we're building a new terminal. So if you can see, it's kind of difficult to see there, but um, the project shown in purple, the, the parking lot around the south end where the future terminal will be, um, that project, as well as the one that is depicted in green in the middle of the picture, uh, we call that one the Apron Phase 1 project. Th both of those projects are set to begin here in the next 60 days, and they're reflected in that, that other slide that had the, uh, the carry forward dollars. Um, so there's a lot of construction activity that is coming underway, and uh, again, we couldn't do that without the, the support of the city, um, our other local partners, and our state and our federal partners as well. So with that, I'd like to transition a little bit. One thing we are not capturing in that budget request is the terminal project, just because of the, 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 the size and the magnitude of this project and the scale. 
it is, it is kind of deserving to be kind of set aside, and so that's what we've done. Uh, but a quick overview of the project, it is roughly a 16,000 square foot building. Uh, it includes 3,000 square feet of leasable space, and we have uh, letters of intent to obligate all of that space already on day one of that project, as well as a, a slightly expanded conference room that we're calling a business center uh, that we hope to hold out not only for, for businesses and economic development, but also um, civic organizations like the Qantas and the Rotary for local government meetings and things like that. We really want to use this terminal uh, in, in new and exciting ways to connect with the community. And so we've had to build in those spaces into the design. And so we're very excited about um, what, what the potential of this future building can and will be. Um, back to that, rev uh, that leasable space, uh, we've also been very intentional in creating new revenue generating opportunities with this building. So getting back to the, the yeah, the financial health of the airport and uh, kind of our get well plan is to develop these new revenue sources and we see this terminal as being really the, the foundation and, and um, uh, the red carpet into our community but also the premier space that most aviation businesses want to be in and so we're taking advantage of that trend as well. Next slide just shows a few renderings of this new facility. Um, uh, we have uh, received uh, feedback from outside architects and, and others uh, that have vast industry experience such as our engineering consultants uh, on this design and um, we are we're very excited to bring this new asset into our community and again we want it to be a place that is welcoming to to all to come out and explore uh, we want to have some uh, even uh, I want to say museum pieces but things that tell the airport story that is inside this building uh, we want to make it a destination and we're actually working with tourism on what we can do to to, to bring that to greater effect. So we're very excited about this design. Um, we hope it's a warm and inviting place, uh, not only for, for pilots and passengers, but also uh, members of the community as well. And we believe it will set us up for a, a future in the aviation industry that uh, it's a little uncertain about how things are gonna go, but um, all of it is exciting. So as Bill mentioned, unmanned systems and regional air mobility and other things that are really taking hold right now, um, this, this building will serve all those. Next slide shows a, a tentative funding plan, and it is tentative right now. A lot of things uh, that we've applied for or that we are forecasting are not definitive yet, uh, but they will be here in the next four to five months. Uh, we have um, roughly four different scenarios that we're working on um, that use a mix of state and federal revenues to the max extent to try to limit or decrease the amount of local share necessary to get this project done. Uh, we've, we've got an unwritten goal, if you will, of uh, trying to develop the funding plan that puts the least burden on any general fund of any jurisdiction that participates in the, in the authority, and I think we're getting there. Uh, we are also exploring a uh, potential debt through the USDA Rural Development Program, uh, and so that would uh, be a, a good backbone of revenues in case we need it, and if we do need to pursue that, uh, we will have to come to the city and have a resolution uh, passed to approve that debt and, and we'd have to do that same thing for all the jurisdictions that support the authority. Uh, all that to say there is still a lot in flux right now. Uh, we are encouraged by uh, some of the signs we've seen and uh, the conversations we've had with some of these grant agencies that we might be able to get um, a good portion, certainly a majority of this project paid for uh, by outside sources. So we will continue to keep you in the loop on that as, as that comes together. Please. You know, I might elaborate a little bit on this. I, I, I've been familiar with the airport function in the past, even before I was on, and, um, and then even more recently since I've been on. And um, we've already, as, as Nick has referred to, had an assessment of what kind of debt we can reasonably take on for the project. He mentions the debt. It's not only that, we've had an it, we, we've had projections of what we can assume. And I'm not sure it fully incorporates the land lease deal that we've got on 31 hangars by a private developer. So not only did we have an assessment of what we as a business can handle in debt, and then if we get other contributions, either federal, state contributions, so be it. Uh, but we, we are also expecting our financial position to be even stronger than now that then was a, a point at which we started to um, investigate the alternatives that Nick, Nick has mentioned. 
I would remind you that may remember that the way so many of these capital projects were funded in the past is people like we would come to the city and the county and say, hey, here's what it is, can you write a check? No more. We're, we're, we're trying to be very responsible stewards of not only our money, but the city's money. And the last thing I would add is a little bit out of place, but I would be remiss. I say this to the county, I say this to the city, I said it to Warren County, Nick too, and Clark, and Shenandoah. We couldn't do what we do without the extra horsepower of the city, and particularly the staff. Nick has been spectacular in establishing relationships with, with staff, but I can tell you, people behind me, people all over the city, in the county, that is value added and we couldn't do it without you. So thanks for that, thanks for the financial support, but it's more than just the financial support. So sorry to digress a bit, but there you go. That's all I've got. Thank you. you stole my conclusion there, Bill. That's a oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you did, because I was going to get to that, um, <laughs> that um, we do have a full agenda. So Understood. Um, um, are you ready to take questions? Yeah, absolutely. Any, any questions? The final slide was just a tentative uh, schedule. Um, but again, uh, a lot's happening this, this coming year for this project, and we're very excited about it. And again, thank you to the city staff. They've been outstanding. Okay. Gentlemen, Council Bell. Just a couple of quick questions on the terminal. The one that you're showing here in the <coughs> terminal project, that's mm -hmm. the preliminary phase, not the building itself. Or is uh, that? The, so in the actual budget itself? Or, uh, in the budget itself, we have a site work phase two project, so that's going to be the final, final project for um, uh, getting the, the finished grade up and, and the final utilities ready for the building construction. Mm -hmm. the, the construction project itself, we anticipate to occur also in FY23, but that's, it's not shown right now in our current budget in terms of a line item. Right, uh, you are showing the, 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 the bid opening, the bid advertising right. bid opening. That that's is right. for the terminal. Building project. Yes, sir. Okay. That's right. That's my question. Councilor Sullivan. Uh, thank you. So, estimated cost for terminal at this point is $10 million. $10 million. Right now, our architects, the last cost estimate we received had three different scenarios ranging from 8 to $10 million. Um, that's taken into account inflation and the uncertainty of the current construction market. Uh, so, we're trying to be as conservative as possible and using the higher value for now. So that was kind of the heart of my question. I mean, you have like, as difficult as it is to do, um, kind of baked in there the, the large swing in prices. We can kind of see either way. We could come in under maybe. That's but right. We could certainly, at this rate, are going to burn through that pretty quickly. We, we agree. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you. I don't. This one's built to last, for lack of a better. That's okay. right. So I confirm. <laughs> <laughs> just want to make sure. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it would be. It would. Um, I would hope it would be. Um, I don't know the full history of the current terminal, but it it seemed to. It, it served its purpose. Purpose, and it it just kind of. I guess they said it was going to be good for twenty five years, and it was. And <laughs> that's kind of it. So hopefully, this one we get some more mileage out of it. Yes. Um, I think the I think the original one has been in place for. I'm sorry, for, forty to forty five years. To eight it has drive it on it, uh, or and and we were starting to have the usual problems with drive it. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing I would say is we have had multiple meetings with the architects in terms of value engineer value engineering and finishes. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some uh, Porsche sort of things in the building that are no longer part of that. We, we've we've mm -hmm. asked their cooperation, shall we say, in uh, coming up with some ways to save money, and we continue that discussion. Right. Does it, just curious, are there any um, kitchen facilities in the, new, in the new building, or is that? Not, not full kitchen. We have a, we call it a kitchenette, which is basically cabinets and a place to put you know, a refrigerator or warming cabinets, if you will, on the business center for like cater, catering to come in, but not a full. Not a full. Not a full. Just curious, because you had mentioned bringing people in and 
right. breakfast meetings or whatever, things like that. Um, there is an office suite for the authority chairman. Let's, let's, <laughs> that's where we have to go get that kind of stuff. For the record, that's bad humor. I was just kidding. <laughs> it's been struck. <laughs> you know I got to do it better. Yeah, I know, I know. So I, uh, quite honestly, um, I see the request. I have not gone to look at the budget to see what we've penciled into for that. I, so I defer to the, my colleagues on that one. All right. Anything else? Nothing else. Thank you. Um, I think I just have a couple questions. Um, I see you did mention that you finally got Warren County to um, pony up after 11 years. How'd you do that? <laughs> well, um, I, I think it was a uh, multiple pronged approach. Um, we actually, interestingly, the first um, development was in our hangar that we acquired, one of the tenants happened to be running for the Board of Supervisors at Warren County. Uh, he did get elected, so that was a huge boost to have somebody who understood the airport intrinsically to be in that position now. Um, I got to mention Bill Wiley, if you're listening. <laughs> uh, he also was instrumental in, in having some conversations with their board directly. Good. Uh, and then just uh, being present at their meetings and having conversations just like this, I think, helped as well. Okay, perfect. And um, <clears throat> so with their contribution, um, I see the city's at 126 thousand as part of the request um, that comes in a little lower than it has been that's right so that's right. Um, which I appreciate mm -hmm. I wish you could have gotten them to give a little bit more but um, <laughs> and the other um, you mentioned that <clears throat> you already have several organizations that are looking to use the space right. are you all going to charge for usage of the facility we, the leasable space, 100%, those will be facility leases. Um, if they're in any way, shape, or form in keeping with our current um, terminal office space, it'll be to the tune of $30 a square foot. The business center then, yes, we would charge for that space as well on a case-by-case -case basis um, as well. So we, we hope to have uh, both of those revenue uh, streams, I guess, unlocked with this new facility. Okay. We, we do view this as class A leasable space and would fully expect it. It's a great question because sometimes it's not done that way, but right. Right. Uh, it's, it's class A leasable space and people <coughs> want to be there because of this new energy and dynamic. Right. And I know, um, I think it was sometime last year you had mentioned possibly having a restaurant in there, but now you're talking about just doing a kitchenette. But you're having organizations that are going to come in to do, um, let's say they do a retreat at your place. So yeah. um, you might want to upgrade your kitchen. Great, uh, yeah, great, great question and comment there. Um, you know, we had a decision to make, I think, at the beginning of this about whether or not to incorporate that restaurant into our terminal facility and add that two, three thousand square feet, whatever it would take to, to get there. At, uh, based on our construction estimates and our budget and our revenue sources, um, it was difficult to uh, full-throated endorse that position just because of the uncertainty of restaurants, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that being said, the kitchenette, we hope, can serve some of that purpose. However, uh, the same developer that's building those hangars, we have a, a provision in our comprehensive agreement for them to build a restaurant. So again, kind of passing that risk all onto the private sector right adjacent to the terminal. We think we can connect the two with like a breezeway. So it still creates a very cohesive campus-like feel. And we think that restaurant then could serve the business center and other functions. But we thought that was a smarter, fiscally more responsible way to go. Well, good. Um, that's all I have. And um, I want to thank you, gentlemen. We've got another question. Nope, no other questions. Thank you all very Thank much. Thank you. Appreciate Great time. presentation. Appreciate yep. The next item on the agenda is FY 2023 proposed administrative department budgets presented by Dan Hoffman, city manager. Celeste Broad Street, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councilor Sullivan, Councilor Bell. 
afternoon. Okay, <clears throat> members of the committee, uh, happy to give you, uh, we're going to start off with the presentation of our department budget. So this is a really a continuation of the discussion we had at the last finance committee <clears throat> where we're going through the various budgets. Uh, the presentation immediately after this, I'll give you a general update on the budget and we'll talk about <clears throat> some bigger, bigger policy questions. Uh, in the interest of time, because we do have a lot of budgets uh, here before us, I'll go move pretty quickly. Feel free to jump in. I also have members from all the various departments here as well. Uh, if you have specific questions about uh, any of the things in front of you. And of course, Celeste will jump in if I gloss over something a little too quickly that needs to be pointed out. <clears throat> this is the list of all the departments we're going through today. Uh, you'll get some of your constitutional officers, a lot of the administrative functions, uh, parks and rec, and others. We'll start with Commissioner of the Revenue. <clears throat> Biggest increase here is from training. Like I said in the last Finance Committee, we're really starting to reinstitute a lot of our training budgets in various places, uh, particularly in places where it's mandatory training to uh, maintain certifications. That's the, the largest increase here, but of course there are also <clears throat> increases related to postage, cigarette tax, so more cost of doing business increases. Uh, treasure, actual small decrease uh, of $200. We did ask everybody to look where they could cut. Uh, <clears throat> although it, it does show a 5% increase, you'll see that frequently throughout this presentation. We've got a lot of smaller budgets. The 5% the uh, average COLA increase has already been baked in, so you might see operating decrease, but a small percentage increase, that's the reason for it. Circuit Court, uh, no increase in this one, relatively small budget. General District Court, uh, $500 decrease. Juvenile, domestic, <coughs> juvenile and Domestic Relations Court, similar. Clerk of the Court, small increase for training. Office of Elections, so this shows a decrease Really, though, that a lot of that decrease is being driven by some one-time software funding last year that's no longer needed, so, or at least the, <clears throat> the one-time expense was uh, expended. Uh, small increase, again, for training and some other printing and operating supply increases. These smaller departments don't have the same inflationary pressures, uh, or at least they don't have inflationary pressures of the same magnitude of our large departments, but they still feel it as well with their operating supplies. City Council, so this is actually <clears throat> your budget. Uh, the only increase here is due to some of the mandatory advertising increases. This is where when we, when we advertise various public hearing ads and whatnot, this, that's why it comes out of here. Uh, small contractual services and increases to Municode, which is the service that we use to publish and update our, well, I think most jurisdictions use it uh, for when we update our ordinances. Clerk of Council, uh, $300 decrease. Uh, my office, uh, <clears throat> small increase, uh, part of it, some of our dues and memberships. A lot of times the uh, membership in whether it's professional organizations or some of the uh, organizations that the city is a membership to, some of those dues have gone up. Also small increase uh, to consulting expenses, which is not really a it is an increase. Last year we actually had $26,000 in there. A lot of that was driven by the one-time expense for the strategic plan consultant. We're putting five in there because this office, uh, I believe it had been cut in past years, so we're restoring it. City, my office obviously uses facil outside facilitators quite frequently, so this is just restoring budget that was cut a couple years back during COVID. <clears throat> Communication. Uh, it shows a pretty large decrease. A lot of that is because we've moved the web maintenance fees over to the IT department, so the SHARP department shows a decrease. Um, there actually is also an increase for, again, training and expenses for Insight Academy, which we just reinstituted after COVID. City Attorney, we've moved some uh, budget around, so there were, we <clears throat> 
had moved, we had a couple of different, I think were constitutional offices that had a budget for city attorney. It was not being used, so we just moved it over here because the city's using, uh, we typically use a bit more than is actually budgeted So for the city attorney, so we just moved some of that money around. Human resources, operating decrease, uh, been able to find some savings with advertising and printing. A lot of our recruitment stuff is online these days. <clears throat> uh, we are uh, increasing, though, some of the uh, charges we use for recruitment and retention. But overall, it's a net decrease. Finance department, we are converting one half-time position to a full-time position in that department to uh, assist with all the additional administrative aspects of that department as well as some of the, the cascade effects of getting various federal monies and compliance and reporting requirements. So uh, we're moving that position from part to full time. And there's also an increase for post position training. Increase for our external auditors and insurance expenses, relatively small. IT, I'll take a moment with this one because this is an area that we're spending, uh, we're investing a significant amount. There is the one new full-time position, a junior network and system admin position. We've talked a little bit about this before. In fact, I believe you got a presentation <clears throat> from uh, our IT director uh, either a meeting or two ago where we walked through a lot of the different projects. To support those projects and a lot of the new needs uh, that are uh, that we're being faced with. Uh, we felt it necessary was a high priority to add this additional position to that department. Uh, <clears throat> we also have some capital decrease, some decreases for one-time capital expenses uh, and uh, many increases to things like our wireless services, hardware and software replacement. Costs in this area are just going up. So <clears throat> a lot of the routine replacements and uh, licenses, software license increases, that they're all going up. So you'll see uh, increases in this area as well, as long as prices stay high. Uh, we're also making significant investments, uh, whether it's a new website, uh, <coughs> NeoGov, uh, Community Pass out of Parks and Rec, implementing and maintaining those things uh, all take time and expense. GIS department, uh, small operating increase. Parks and Rec is another one uh, where we have, we're making some significant investments during COVID and while we had budget concerns in that period, <clears throat> a lot of things were either paused or trimmed back in terms of maintenance. Uh, we also have a significant amount of uh, facilities. We've got some wonderful facilities, but they're beginning to show their age. Uh, <clears throat> we are also moving all, th this department has a significant number of uh, part-time employees who were moving up to $15 per hour. We talked a little bit about that in a prior meeting, so that's driving a lot of the costs here as well. <clears throat> Many of the things you see uh, in this list, on this particular slide, they are uh, things that we might be using one-time fund balance money for. So things like fence repairs and uh, other infrastructure improvements. And we have capital increase here as well for that department to replace some older uh, vehicles. And those are the departments that we're discussing today. So happy to field any questions or call any of the subject matter experts up if there's something that we can't answer. Thank you. Um, before we go to questions, Carrie, um, on the regional airport, there wasn't any action that needed. It was just a presentation, correct? Thank you. All right, counselors, um, let's go first. I'll, I'll Councilor Bell. Sure. Um, just I made some notes as we were going through the individual categories, but on, um, you know, and some of this ties together where we're either moving or shifting budget line items around. <coughs> uh, obviously, it's, you know, look at the money we saved over here, but we've moved it to this category. Um, the legal, when we were talking about legal counsel or city attorney, um, the constitutional still have access to the city attorney for council. legal counsel. Yes. Right. So that no longer needs to be a budget line <coughs> item for them. It's just a request for services or. We do track. So in some cases, uh, I think it's the Grafton lawsuit. We do keep tabs on how much uh, is being attributed to that particular okay. endeavor. But uh, <coughs> for just example, as a cost Will center Will or, or? office over at the clerks, I think we had, was it? We had, yeah. 
we had like five thousand dollars in his department and will's not a frequent user of the <laughs> city attorney's fees so we didn't feel the need to keep the money <laughs> yeah, which is a good thing which is a great thing I'm like an Anna Jeff's office at ten thousand each so we moved eight out of each left two thousand in their budget just in case there were some legal fees so yeah. there's still some budget in their offices Got it. But that, from that budgetary standpoint, it's just internal movement. It, Correct. Yep. Correct. Um, and then in the rec the references to training, is that uh, how much of this is new or expanded training and how much of this is just reinstituting? Virtually all of it. I, in fact, training. I can't think of anything that's new training. It's just reinstituting <clears throat> We're reinstituting just the mandatory training uh, that's, that's required at this point. There are a few uh, where, you know, a conference might garner that employee continuing education credits that they mm -hmm. need for recertifications. Uh, so there's some of that in there, uh, but it's all reinstituting from what was cut. The training budget for the city during COVID was cut almost entirely. So we're slowly building that back up. I know it's understandable, the limitations on travel and oh, yeah. being yeah. together in large groups. Um, and then when we get to the, the larger concept of the money movement, mm -hmm. I know some in some cases it's moved for, you know, being at the right place, the, the, the most appropriate administrator of the that portion of the budget. Are any economies anticipated in this month in this movement? So uh, yes, for <clears throat> we did consolidate maintenance and facilities maintenance. So uh, it right. used to be that we had two separate uh, kind of facilities and maintenance teams, one with Parks and Rec, one with General City. Uh, we've consolidated those two to allow for a, a bit of cross-training and some efficiencies between the two teams. Mm -hmm. uh, it's now all overseen by Corey McKnight, our facilities uh, director. So uh, <coughs> we, I made that move uh, not too long ago, mm -hmm. uh, and we've just been now shifting the money from point A to point B. Uh, there, you know, in general, they're hiring for a lot of the same skill sets, uh, <coughs> and it's it's also. You know, useful to be able to move people you know, around from facility to facility or, or support each other. Uh, not that they couldn't do that beforehand, but now it's all coordinated under Corey. Okay. So questions I might have. Councilor Sullivan? Um, I guess I'll start off with maybe a question about the sort of parks and recs mm -hmm. uh, request. There's the $88,000 for guardrail guard, guard fence repairs and the bridge maintenance on the Shawnee Springs wetlands. So that's Pull it back up in here. my neighborhood, which is kind of why I'm asking, what <laughs> is the background on the bridge? Because the bridge, there's two bridges. Yeah, I'll call up uh, Chris. <clears throat> yep. Just cur more curious than, uh, it's yeah. Chris's first budget, everybody. So <clears throat> come on up, speak <laughs> in the mic. Right. <laughs> first budget with us, first budget with us. Chris is a microphone. No, no, you just stand up the mic. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. First time. <laughs> so, yeah, the, uh, it's just simple maintenance on the Abrams Creek wetland bridges. It's nothing complex. Uh, okay. the they're one, functional right now. The one bridge that crosses, if I'm thinking of the same one, um, it basically crosses the town run down by City Yards. Yes. Mm -hmm. cross, yeah. By yeah. the railroad tracks. Yes, that's part of it. And that is a city-owned bridge? Yes. Okay. And then there's also uh, the lower marsh, so on the, uh, this near uh, Meadow Branch. Okay. So they added some things on the, on the lower marsh side. So bridging is part of that. Too. They have their viewing deck back in there, so that's part of that as well. Um, just so people can access the viewing sure. deck. Sure. Okay. And then... I apologize. This is the same question asked a different way, but a little more background: the, the, the four hundred fifty-eight thousand dollars. That's kind of a, we're shifting that money. Yeah, it's just money moving from one place to the other. Okay. And that's for the grounds maintenance. Yeah. And that money that was before it was here. It was in the it public was works budget. It, it was, was in, in parks, parks and it it's moving over budget. to public services. We're actually creating an internal service fund for ground. Um, for the IT budget, um, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> 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 There's 
Um, we had we had previously discussed moving towards uh, being able to offer uh, online payment options. Is that rolled up in here yes. somewhere? Yep, we're pretty close. A lot of the other investments we're making, such as the website, we're taking steps to make sure that uh, as much as possible integrates in with that. So there will be a, one single portal for our residents. Okay. Um, for the wireless devices and, and services, do you put out an RFQ for that, or do we just go pick a vendor and? Tyler. So uh, we use uh, FirstNet, so it's prioritized for first responders that can be uplifted during times. Of Oh, so this is not the average cell phone. Yes. No, no, no. So yeah. This all was elevated when COVID hit. Okay. It all became yeah. prevalent. It's just that's just budgeting action. Yeah. And AT and T was awarded that contract by the Fed, so we oh, so just basically use that contract. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, that was it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Tyler, you can come back up. Yeah. No. I, um, so with, so I see that there's an increase of 397,000 for contractual services and things and the cost of the update. But <clears throat> at the bottom there, there's a 214,000 decrease. Um, and with bringing um, some of the other departments online, um, can you do the math here for me? So our budget's a little, different than most. We, we cover <coughs> expenses related to HR, finance, parks, NeoGov, community pass, those sorts of things. Those come out of our budget as well. So there's a lot of things in there. When it looks elevated, that's because other departments are increasing their services as well. So there's kind of an ebb and flow. So for example, we have implementation of NeoGov, right? So it's a large expense. NeoGov? Right? Yeah, NeoGov. Okay. So we have the annual maintenance plus any sort of implementation fees and so on and so forth. So it's going to go up and down, but a lot of it's kind of, not to use Paula as a specific example, but a lot of times it's based on what the other departments are doing. Yeah. So, so that, again, okay. so that $214,000 decrease that you're seeing is again almost, it's a realignment of the expenses. So they were capital expenses that we purchased last year. Now we're moving them up into the operating budget. So okay. And you'll see more and more of that as we shift things over to cloud services in particular. Uh, we're no longer hosting much, if anything, here uh, on our servers. Mm -hmm. A lot of times the way the, the price structures used to be for software was you could just make a big capital purchase, you stroked a big check, you implemented it, and it was done. You may be paid uh, a small amount if you needed to upgrade to the latest version, but that was it. Now, most of the services we bought, NeoGov's a perfect example, you pay an annual subscription fee and sometimes that subscription fee goes up. So it's less one-time upfront capital intensive and it's just spread out over the course of you know, the life of your use of the service. Those increases, uh, you know, sometimes they'll, they're normally based on a contract. Uh, if we're committed to a particular piece of software and it's working well for us and they increase it by you know, subscription fees by 10%, that's something we typically have to absorb uh, because switching over to another product, you know, normally takes a lot of time planning and you, you should have a pretty strong rationale for making the jump. And they, and they know that. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Of course. The other, um, Dan, mm -hmm. so um, the city council's budget. Mm -hmm. Now, this has always been somewhat of a problem or I don't know if you would call it a problem or um, it's always been an issue for us that um, there's mandatory advertising fee that we have to do and uh, it seems that it goes up each year um, um, if we can think about including that in our legislative agenda for um, next year because <clears throat> as the budgets get tighter and there's certain things that uh, we possibly can do through our communication departments uh, that are a lot cheaper mm -hmm. um, and even through Facebook and Instagram and things like that as opposed to placing an ad 
um, um, that will help save money and we can put it in other places. Absolutely. We, we've trimmed it. <clears throat> we were publishing more than we needed to at one point. Uh, mm -hmm. We trimmed it down a, a significant amount, but there are still some mandatory things uh, that we have to, so we'll add that to the next legislative agenda. That would be great. And um, I think my my last question is for the Commission of Revenue. Um, Ms. Burkholder, please. I see that um, on yours, there's a, at the very top, um, there's $3,000 increase for a cigarette tax stance. Um, is that state? Um, That's just the cost of doing business. We used to order, for example, four cases a year, and then when some of our drugstores stopped selling, vaping increased, so far we um, didn't need to order as many, so we had stock on hand. And of course, with COVID, we cut the budget to the bare bones, and we just need to order a few more this year. So that's just a supply and demand. Oh, it's not an increase in people smoking? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> At least not smoking tax cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, strike that one too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, right. We'll move on to the next part. One thing I did want to point out that I forgot to mention when we had the city council slide. Uh, a couple councilors had talked to me about having some type of uh, CPI uh, increase because for the counselor allowance uh, I didn't want to include it not because I was making a judgment value on that but just because I felt it was more a discussion for council to have if they wanted to do that but I did because a couple of counselors did ask me to about it uh, I just told them that was something they should bring to their colleagues it's not factored in here you guys are still at the same rate as before based on this if you want to direct me otherwise you know, we're happy to I think there's a discussion that all of council should have, and it's probably not the right time to do that. Anyway. We'll have a full, you'll, you'll have a good opportunity for that at the second meeting in April. So. Okay. I did have a follow up. Yes. Um, looking at some of the numbers for the city attorney, um, we're, we're at 216K for this year. Is that basically, um, can that be converted back into hours? Yes, <clears throat> it could. Uh, I don't know what those hours are off the top of my head, but she built us by the hour. So. They're built by the hour. Yeah. Okay, because I can see over the past couple of years we were well above that amount. We tried to uh, manage. But the reality is we just don't know. True. It, it goes up and down based on need. <clears throat> it could be uh, things that we have no control over. Um, we've been... Uh, coordinating to make sure that we're more cognizant and that I'm more aware of what gets passed along to the city attorney. Uh, so well, if I may, <laughs> I will tell you that, that this was the decision to, to go in this direction was predicated on saving money, mm -hmm. and that's not been the case. And that's clear over the, the, you can look at the numbers and tell that. I think the last city attorney, um, I think his base was 160, 180K a year-ish, I'm guessing. And we got him for 40 hours a week. And he probably worked 60 or 70 hours a week. So our hourly rate is much more, is much better than we are getting from paying hourly for an attorney. So it's well, a math problem. Yeah, well, it's a math problem, but it's also quality too. Well, so, <laughs> okay, yeah. we want to go down that road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Fair but, enough. okay, so. Was there any other questions? No, it's a few guys have questions. No, good. <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm not going to respond there. to that at all. I'm so. just, just going to just, just so, <laughs> so it's out there for, uh, you know, um, in public mm -hmm. that we're doing a budget and it's about, you know, coming up with a number and a value that I think that's, um, should be taken into consideration. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll move on to the next item, which is a continuation of this lesson. All right, the uh, next item on the, uh, so you're done with that? Yep, we're done with that one, so. All right, so. Thanks, the, everybody. <laughs> I'm clear.
The next item on the agenda is uh, 2023 budget discussion presented by Dan Hoffman and Celeste Corey. That's Corey. right. <coughs> if you take over from here, okay. please. We will move um, through this. A lot of this you've already had, so I'm going to skim some slides. Uh, really just going to point out the, the, the updates. Based on the feedback at the last Finance Committee meeting, <clears throat> we consolidated into one scenario. Uh, so the current <clears throat> proposed budget, there is one <laughs> draft budget that we're moving forward with uh, that does not include a half percent meals tax increase. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to go through this and update you. Here's where we're at. <clears throat> uh, we're here today at the Finance Committee, April 5th. Uh, next week, you will get a presentation from Winchester Public Schools regarding their budget. Their budget was approved on March 28th by their board. Uh, <clears throat> they're bringing forward a request that is higher than uh, what we had previously anticipated mm -hmm. due to their proposed uh, salary increases. Uh, I'm not going to just, I'm not going to get into that today. You're going to have full opportunity with school staff to do that next week. Um, but I, I would go ahead and throw out there that uh, <clears throat> we now have a scenario that does currently we're working under a draft budget that does not include a property tax increase, uh, a meals or really any tax increases. We do have a couple of fees that are going up, uh, but we're not increasing any taxes. Uh, I mean, in consultation with, with uh, my finance team, I, I don't see how we could accommodate that without uh, an increase of some sort, because we've been factoring that a uh, million dollars as that placeholder that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I think their, their current request is closer to 1.9 uh, million. So you'll see that next week. You'll be able to discuss it with them uh, if it's something you want to entertain. You know, I will need some direction from uh, committee or council to develop a different scenario. Mm -hmm. Fund balance policy, we've kind of gone over this a uh, couple of times. Nothing's changed here. So unassigned fund balance. So this is where we get for some of those one-time expenses, you know, fixing rails and bridges and uh, the elevator, those kinds of things where uh, they come out of there. More projected unassigned. This hasn't changed, I don't believe. Or has this it? Is, yeah, this is a new slide we added. Nope. So yeah. it just shows you where we are with total fund balance as of June 30th, 2021. So I've projected the revenues and expenditures for FY22. Um, then the next line will tell you what we're expecting to use for capital projects and transfers. Out of that 5.1 million, there's 1.6 coming from fund balance um, for capital projects if needed. So that gives us a total uh, projected fund balance of uh, June 30th of 26.6. And then the unassigned number, so we want to keep that between 20, at a minimum of 20%, and then a max of 25. So we'll we're almost be at 25 at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. And then for the current budget, the 23 budget, we're projecting a use of 1.5. So we're well, we'll keep well within our, our fund balance policies. General fund highlights. <clears throat> We've gone over this for the most part. Our summary, uh, so walking through just some of the things that uh, may have changed. Celeste, you want to hit some of the revenues? Sure. So um, since the last finance committee, um, we have revised the local um, tax projection, but we've updated about $200,000. And that's based on the um, business license taxes that have come in. They've really come in strong. Um, they were due March 1st. but they're well exceeding budget now, so we went ahead and adjusted that about two hundred thousand dollars, and then added the fifty-six thousand dollars for the um, uh, proposed fee increases, uh, permit fee increases. Everything else is pretty consistent. <clears throat> uh, we still are at a five percent average increase for city staff. Um, these are the other areas. Uh, 
don't think we've had any changes here. This is the, I think this regional jail number is the updated number. We don't anticipate that it's gonna to move too much from there. So you know, we are still at 620, an increase of 626,000. Anything else there, Celeste? No. Okay. Revenue, so <clears throat> I think Councillor Sullivan had asked for you know, a, a table to show the percentage variance and percentage increase. So across all of our different revenues, this is the, the increases or decreases in some case that, you, that we're seeing. Position changes. Uh, we were able to increase our main, when we consolidated down into one scenario, <clears throat> we were able, especially with some of that additional business tax revenue, to add uh, an additional maintenance tech in our facilities team. The initial department request was three. We came in with one, this additional revenue. Uh, we're adding an additional one. General fund department highlights. I don't think we have anything major to change here. All the same. This is also consistent, so I want to move quickly through it. Yeah, there's all the IT stuff, which we've already discussed, some of the one-time capital and parks, which we just discussed. Our general fund equipment, a lot of this, <clears throat> this is where some of that one-time, pretty much all that one-time money goes when we talk about the fund balance excess. This is actually all operating. This is all operating. Oh, okay. Keep that so that we we can make this out operating, and that gives us a good base to go forward each year to be able to replace equipment that we need without mm -hmm. dipping into reserves so. or borrowing. Yeah. Oh, here's the one-time funds. Sorry. So this is where we get matching for new buses, uh, <clears throat> a match for the airport capital grants, the elevator we've talked about and some improvements to Preston Field. We'll be coming back with an MOU at the June. So in June, we're gonna to come to you with an MOU regarding uh, Preston Field and turfing uh, soccer fields on Preston over at the park. So more about that coming soon. Expenditures year over year with variance now with the uh, percentage. Gonna roll through in case unless there are any questions. And that's where we're at for the budget. So the next step uh, for the city in terms of presentations, going to the calendar <clears throat> next week, public schools, second meeting, we'll do a full budget presentation to the full council. So really a culmination of all of these different committee meetings we've been having, um, <clears throat> we're now gonna bring it all in one package to the city council for feedback and approval. Uh, our hope, uh, of course, is that, you know, at that stage, there are major changes. Of course, you will have just heard from, the, in the meeting before, you will have heard from the public school system. So you may have some changes. We'll be ready for those at that time. Um, <clears throat> but we will not be, in that presentation on the 26th, we're not gonna go into as much detail for every department as we've done in the committee level. We're really gonna roll it up and ask for some major, uh, if there are uh, major changes. Uh, after that, first reading, May 10th, and uh, if all goes well, we'll have a, an approved budget and a public hearing on May 24th. Happy to answer questions if you can. What I would suggest uh, before we go through the questions is um, if you can send an email out to all of council, mm -hmm and maybe provide links to the last couple of finance committee meetings that you did on budget presentations mm -hmm. so that they could um, in essence sort of catch up a little bit Absolutely. and then um, some of their questions that they may have could be answered yeah. and by the time we reach um, <clears throat> April 26 then it won't be such a, a long meeting that would be lovely. Uh, I'll send it out. Uh, <laughs> I'll send it out uh, this Friday. Uh, my biweekly report that I send to the council. That would be uh, great. I'll, put, I'll send it out this Friday as part of that. All right. And then I'll follow up with please read. Yes. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> really, really please read. All right. Who wants to start? Before you start. I really just have one one question. Um, so one thing you had mentioned was um, 
the increase in the business tax licensure. Is that because A, we have more businesses, or B, people just decided to pay it earlier or sooner, or what do you think that, um, how do you would attribute that? No, I think it's just, you know, those those licenses are based on gross receipts, so. Oh, so their gross receipts mm -hmm. are, oh, I see, okay. So it wasn't, it wasn't their business registration, yeah. it was their gross receipts. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's promising. Yes. That's good so, yeah, the retail was up and um, mm -hmm. professional licenses were up significantly. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Bell. Um, Denver, uh, question I have that may go towards the personnel side of it because obviously adding staff and increasing salaries whether it's COLA or incentives mm -hmm. plays into a kind of a strategy of retention mm -hmm. what is our retention looking like or do we can you report back to us on what our retention looks like per category whether it's public safety city staff I'd like to have the same <clears throat> question to Winchester Public Schools as well. So uh, I don't have the specific departments off the top of my head. I can ask uh, Ms. Nofsinger to, to pull that by department. Mm -hmm. uh, we're at 17% and we've been holding at 17% for the last several years. So turnover. we've not seen a turnover. Uh, so it's, and that goes back, I think the last number I saw was going back four years. So we, we vary between 17 and 18 every year and it's been consistent. Is that inclusive of Winchester Public Schools or separate? That is not inclusive of Winchester Public Schools. Okay. Is that it? On the capital improvement budgets, obviously we're talking about two separate things here. General fund and annual revenue budget. Capital improvements is funded from that. But these are one-time costs. Um, so, well, we're really funding one, if this is the, the requested amount, 1.5429 mm -hmm. for these items here, it's to be determined if those actually, I mean, those are the ones that are building the budget request for capital improvements. Correct. So that they could move and shift if the priorities of the city move and shift, <coughs> or these. If they're proposed and approved, we would come back to council if there was any major changes, you know, if we decided uh, we weren't going to fix the elevator. Uh, we'd come back, and we were going to use that money for some other purpose. We'd come back and you know, have that discussion with council. Because you've enumerated and identified specific uses. Correct. Yeah. You should we'll, expect it. And we'll come back in the next um, the meeting on the 26th. We'll have the full uh, capital improvement plan for you, the five-year plan that would yeah. include all the capital projects with all the different funding. So this is just yeah. one um, specifically with general fund on balance, but yeah. all the things that. Perry's proposing he's got a hold of us. We're not, uh, Mary, correct me if I'm wrong, we're not anticipating borrowing uh, not any, calendar, not this calendar year. So, mm -hmm. and a lot of that is, <clears throat> that's great because we will in some coming years. So that's why that five year plan is important. Um, we know there are going to be some, some major expenses, uh, you know, new fire station under the Y. So this year mm -hmm. we're not going to borrow any money if, as long as we. Hopefully, we won't borrow any money. Okay. That's it? Yes. Um, going back to the retention question mm -hmm. that he had. So, um, just as an observation, I watch that board every time I'm in the building, the mm -hmm. uh, digital board, and I see that there's more positions on there that I've seen before. Um, are some of those new positions being offered or there we normally we normally always some of them are hard to fill positions that we just always keep posted so okay. uh, I don't think we we're always going to have a few police officer openings okay. you know we're, we're basically at full staff with PD now but there's still a couple of vacant positions so maintenance positions um, you know at any given point you know we might have uh, how many positions open, Paula? We've, we've been averaging around 50 for the past several months. 50? 50. Yeah. So any 50, time, 50, 50, 50 for the yeah. whole city. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is about So is that an average um, prior to COVID, too? It's a little higher than normal prior to COVID. Um, 
Okay. Before COVID, we would average around maybe 35 or so, 35 or 40 openings each month. Um, that hasn't increased since COVID. Okay. So we're still pretty much the same as we've been in the past. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have more openings now than we did when we first started. Okay. Um, that was my only question. So, th thank you all. All right. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a resolution adopting amendments to Winchester Comprehensive Employee Management System, presented by Paula Nofsinger, HR Director. Good afternoon, Mayor, Good afternoon. Counselors. So we are always looking at our SIMS policies, and recently we've noticed that our grievance policy needs some updating. The grievance policy is dictated by state code. So with Melissa's help, we've come up with these recommended changes to our grievance policy that are purely administrative in nature. Um, but because it's dictated by state code, when a jurisdiction changes its grievance policy, the jurisdiction has, has to then certify that the policy meets the requirements of the state code and then that certification has to be filed with the clerk's office for the city. So that's why you're seeing these administrative changes today to get your approval and then ultimately council's approval. Okay. Any questions from Paula? Just, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Who provides this certification? Is this outsourced or is this No, we do. Dan and the, city, and the city attorney will certify it. Okay. Okay. No questions? No questions. Um, any action, just need action to move forward, uh, so I need a motion. Uh, motion to forward to council. I have a motion to forward. Uh, all in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Opposed? This has been forwarded to council. Thank, Thank you, Paula. You. Um, the next item is an ordinance to amend and reenact section 6 through 27 of the Winchester City Code pertaining to building permits. Fees presented by Sean Hirschberger. I guess we can leave the door open now that, that everybody's gone. And there's lots of room in here now. Oh dear. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. situated so what in, what is in front of you is an ordinance to amend and reenact uh, section 6-27 of the Winchester City Code pertaining to building permit fees uh, building permit fees were established as a way to uh, basically make the permit or the building and inspections uh, department self-sustaining and what we've seen you know, as we're reviewing the fee structure and the, the revenue brought in, is that it's not, uh, it's not doing that. It's not accomplishing that goal. Uh, and the fee structure has not been changed for uh, roughly, it's eight years, is that uh, correct? Since 2003. 2003, much longer than eight More years. More than eight years. Almost 20 years. So one of the things, we're gonna do some highlights of is kind of the, the main, big fees that are being addressed and uh, then also just a summary of the fact that m the majority of uh, fees pertaining to building code building permits are also being addressed as well but the highlights going starting with a plan review fee this is you know a pretty standard uh, thing with other localities the the concept is when people come in for either single family dwelling substantial addition they pay for the plan review this is a function that we ought, that we provide. Uh, you know, the uh, spending time up front reviewing the plans ensures that all codes are adhered to, and errors are caught in the beginning as opposed to further down the road. Um, it, the sorry, the residential plan review fee would be sixty dollars for uh, residential permit. Uh, for new residential uh, dwelling for alterations or additions, it would be six or thirty dollars. On the commercial side, it would be based on square footage of all the floors of the, of the structure. Expedited plan review 
uh, services, normal plan review, seven to 10 days. Uh, people do often come in and say, you know, they want expedited permit review uh, or plan review. So instead of uh, it, the expedited review services 300 over the proposed 150 standard uh, standard review time frame. Sorry. So it's just a basically doubling the fee. What is the standard? Standard time, time frame. frame. Standard time frame is seven to ten seven, days. Yeah, yes. Seven to ten days. Expedited at least three to five. Yes. Makes three days. Three to five. Three to five. It's like cuts it in half. Thank you. This this looked a lot better on a on a laptop or on a computer monitor. I'm assuming you guys can see this. Uh, no, but but but. but no, but go ahead. Okay. So I'll say, just as we dive into this, this is a, uh, there's a lot to absorb when you look at all of the fees that are being changed. Uh, you know, if there are questions, if there, you know, is a desire to have some time to absorb them and come back with some recommendations, be happy to do that. I'm going to blow up some of these so you can see them more while we're sitting here. This is, this is the proposed uh, plan fee structure just for the for the highlights for the for the main permits so if you look if you take sorry I won't move this around too fast if you take the residential and institutional commercial and industrial industrial shell remodeling residential new construction and just look at the Winchester column and then look at uh, you know Harrisonburg to other the the largest city in the Shenandoah Valley very you know it's bigger than Winchester but we have a lot of similarities you see that these changes will put us in line with what Harrisonburg does uh, Frederick City um, Fredericksburg City apologize that it same same story it'll put us still kind of below but it'll put us more in line with them uh, Manassas City as well it's the same story so pretty much for all of our contemporaries within the within you know the region this would put us close to but still in general below the the, the our, all of our counterparts and the kind of the the thought process here is again it's been nearly 20 years since they've been addressed I, I think all of you have noticed that Winchester is a attractive place for investment uh, the, the this new proposed fee structure would definitely not uh, get to the level that would make people think twice about doing business in Winchester, but it does come, cl it, it brings us closer to having you know, the people that are coming and building new product in Winchester. It, it brings us closer to the point where they are actually paying for the services that they are getting provided, as opposed to having those paid for just through regular taxpayer dollars. Examples, walking through a couple of again the highlighted highlight uh, permit the highlight fees on a re on the residential side. If you look at a typical new fam new single family home, twenty five hundred square feet, current fee uh, twenty five hundred square feet times point one six four hundred dollars. Proposed fee would bring that up to six hundred twenty five plus a sixty dollar plan review fee. So it's only in, a, in for every standard single family dwelling, it's only an additional $285 for the permit. Uh, actual square footage, new single family homes in Winchester, 32,013. Uh, so last year, this would have seen an increase uh, of $36,000 brought into the city, $36,000 additional revenue based on last year's uh, activity. And then the actual square footage of existing square single family homes having alterations or remodelings that this proposed fee structure would have brought in an additional eight thousand five hundred fifteen dollars continuing looking at the commercial side uh, commercial building individual building convenience store ten thousand square feet the proposed fee structure would only increase the fee by uh, one thousand dollars so when you think of the, you know, the grand scheme of things, it's, it's a pretty minor adjustment of what would be being paid. Um, actual er, new construction, two-story apartment building, uh, 39,000 square feet. 
that would be an increase of twenty seven hundred dollars from the per from the current permit fees to the proposed current. Uh, permit fees, it would be an additional $2,700. And then you look at the history of you know the past year, if these fees were in place, uh, new commercial structures, that would have been an increase revenue generated of $25,739. And um, alterations or remodeling would have been an additional, a little over 14,000. Total increase from these examples, just from these examples, from the highlighted examples, which would capture the majority of the revenue, is about fifty-six thousand six hundred dollars. And with that, we are here for questions. Gentlemen, sure. Yeah. Um, all right. Based on this projected number of fifty-six thousand six hundred six, I know this is a projection. Um, but kind of more looking at the increase in fees from the current structure to what's being proposed. What's the aggregate change percentage we're looking at? Is this a 25% change? It's roughly 30%. 30% if, if we take an average across the board, it's, it's, it's an average of 30%. Okay. Um, and when you spread that out over 17, 18, 19 years, the last time this was done, cost of inflation, it's probably absorbed right there. Um, it may be a reminder for us to revisit this more frequently, just so that it doesn't feel like such a huge jump. Um, but, you know, recognizing that we're trying to tie these fees to the services provided. Granted, I don't think you're ever going to get to a zero sum where it's just netting out completely. It's a wonderful place for us to get to. But, um, you know, we've had costs increasing every year as this goes up so it doesn't surprise me that we're in the negative from that concept um, and these individual categories that you're identifying with a residential remodel addition new construction commercial um, we've got pretty strong data of the permits over time to see how those are trending and if fee adjustments would impact those we yes we could we could pull that data out pretty quickly and i mean obviously we'll know the impact of fee increases until we increase the fees right correct okay but i i think you know we've taught we've had a lot of discussion about this you know on multiple levels and I, it's the the increases are fairly modest mm -hmm. I, I think we could we could bear a lot more from from a standpoint of the consumer and you know when we've had uh when, when we've used third-party vendors, you know, the, their fees are significantly larger, like significantly larger than ours. And, and it's just, you know, it's just a cost of doing business. It's, you know, people are used to paying fees. <coughs> well, just to follow up again, quick math. I mean, these increases spread over the time since the last increase are one, one and a half percent per <coughs> increase when we've seen inflationary costs substantially more than that. And I think it would be helpful as you see, you know, if council approves this over the next year, we see impacts. If we see no impacts, it would be good for that to be reported out. If we see decreases in certain sectors, it would be helpful to know too. We don't want fees to be an impediment Absolutely. to growth. Um, so it has been a while since we've visited this and done any updates. Um, I guess kind of thinking out loud, I mean, there's the, there's the person that takes on a project, you know, on the weekends, and then there's a person that does it during the week for a living. And they kind of, we're, we're, fair or unfair, we're kind of rolling them up into one, you know, customer, you know, we're treating them kind of the same. Um, so just for my own clarification, you know, if, if someone were to put a deck on their house, they would have to submit a plan to your office, your office reviews it, and that would cost $75 to do that. 150 150 uh, No, the plan review was 30. 30. 30. Oh, oh, the plan review is 30. 30. 30 for an addition or deck. And then oh, oh, that's for residential. 
Yes, that's correct. Okay. And, okay. and then there's a fee for the deck itself, which would be fifty dollars. Okay, so eighty dollars. Okay, yes, and then for that, they get an inspector to re to review the plan, or then you come out and then also yes, provide some. You did this right? Did that wrong? Things like that's that. Correct. Yes. Yeah, we'll review the plans, and then we also do the inspections to make sure it's in compliance with the approved set of plans. Okay, so they're getting some value added for their for their <laughs> for the fee. Okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, sorry, my iPad went crazy. Um, if this is the market, what the market's, if this is where it's at, that's where it's at. And if we're not covering our costs based on the services we provide, then I think we have to examine the way that, you know, that we're doing it. Um, it's, Is it pretty steep? I, if it's in line with other localities, I think it's. I think we're in the in the right direction. I certainly what wouldn't want to be the most expensive. That's that's usually not a good thing. But um, I understand the need for it. So, thank you. So, um, so um, I've asked this question for years about increasing. Um, the um, fees for the services that were being rendered, and um, because I thought at some point we were too low compared to other localities, there was, there's always been a resistance. I don't know why. I don't know. There was um, staff reluctance, department reluctance, city manager reluctance, but here we are now with a proposal to catch up. And if it had been done incrementally over the years, then it wouldn't be such a big pill to swallow. And that's what this seems like. I always believe in that you pay for what you get. And so if someone's gonna charge me this amount of money, then I better get some good service behind it. But I was always of the mind that some of these increases could have happened over time. They didn't, and here we are. I would like to see, and I know that we are at, um, um, we're very near to other localities and that we aren't um, as high. I would like to see maybe a um, a second proposal for an increase because <clears throat> we've increased um, we've, we've attached fees over the last couple of years even with the trash can fees and a few others and um, we aren't raising taxes but um, and I understand the need for um, for increasing the fees, but if we, if you can come up with another scenario, um, so that it's not such a hard pill to swallow, and then we can look at maybe another increase next year. Um, so that will be my suggestion. If that's if that's the desire. Uh, um, so I'm putting that out there because I know that this will um, this will need to be forwarded to council, and um, so is there any discussion? Well, just a little further discussion related yeah. to that. Like, you know, we're talking about having not increased for 19 years. One of the things that I was going to propose or ask is. What would be the effective date of this change? July 1st? Yes. July 1st. Um, and I know not a lot of contractors do um, hard bids anymore because pricing is so difficult to, uh, to manage. And But people are budgeting for projects. And even though fees and permits pale in comparison to building materials and labor costs, still to be able to have time to for people to become aware of this and adjust for it, um, I was thinking just in terms of delaying or having it phased in 
but I have no problem in support of the mayor's suggestion to have this be maybe one percentage increase this year and maybe the following year or a year after that, getting it up to, to snuff. Um, and that's just, again, it's 30%. I know we're in line, but it's a large jump. And it's just something people are going to pounce upon of increasing fees. Um, so I could definitely support suggesting maybe a, a, a two-step process and then through that, depending on your understanding of conditions as to whether it's this much this year and this much next year or this much two years from now, however that factors in. You've got all of this projected fee increase into the current budget year, or not the current budget year, the proposed budget. Yes. yes there, there is so if we break it up into pieces, you're going to say, well, i got to... The, the total increase, I want to say, is probably about sixty thousand dollars. It, it is. is the, so, if it was one of the things we actually need guidance from the committee on today, what would that step be? So, if it's, do you want us to split it up and just do thirty this year and the next? Year? I would suggest uh, splitting it in half um, to thirty, and um, because not only that, um, with. Um, um, the taxes on automobiles that people had to pay. So this year, coming out of probably like the worst time of our lives and then trying to catch up and then we start to get hit with these um, fees and taxes, um, we need to just um, be mindful of that. So just to, if, if I may, yeah. just bringing back the example, so think of, you know, not to you know, thinking, think about like the Royal Farms, on what? the Royal Farms project. Mm -hmm. on, it's a fairly significant investment for, for a private, uh, for a commercial entity. Uh, they, you know, using this new commercial building around 10,000 square feet, that would have increased, the new fees would have increased their permit, total permit package by a thousand dollars. So that's, you know, just putting it in a little perspective from like a commercial side especially. And then the 39,600 square foot building, I believe that was taken from the, I can't remember the name of the project. Home Valley Drive, the H&W H project. So that would have been 2,700 in total, like the, the new fee structure. Right. So it's 30% it's, it sounds like a lot, in the in the grand scheme of things, the actual you know when you're looking at a multi-million dollar project, the 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 increase is is fairly limited. I just wanted to highlight right, that. Again. Right. Right. So, so I'm glad that you pointed that out because then there is a, there is sort of another scenario that could be looked at um, <clears throat> where you have. Um, well, then you can't, well, like the um, the example that Councilor Sullivan brought up with um, um, someone that, that works on the project on the weekends, like you do a fixer up at home or something like that, versus a, a handyman or a contractor that does it for a living. Um, <clears throat> When, when someone comes in for a permit to do an addition of the house, there's a, there's a, they're distinguished between business and a residence, correct? Residential and commercial. Right, right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the other scenario is, is maybe keeping the increase for the commercial and reducing the the residential to thirty well to half. So, is that possible to? Of of, I, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll need to consult the city attorney because uh, all all of this was done in consultation with Melissa, and there's a lot, okay. of, a lot of very specific rules around how how much and why and who. Uh, okay. Because it all has to be rooted in some way based on. Actual cost. So, okay. uh, putting, I don't believe we could place kind of an artificial. So, you would have to do it either across the board or not at all, is what you're saying? Well, it has to be based on actual. So, a lot of this, uh, we're comfortable with the percentage increase because we're so far behind. 
<clears throat> so that's part of the reason why we know that this jump is justifiable. It's actually pretty conservative compared to what we could do. So we're comfortable with that aspect of it. More kind of detailed increases or decreases in specific places, that's going to require, I think, a little more discussion with Melissa uh, so that we don't run afoul of uh, an increase that might not be warranted or a decrease that might not be fair. So. I, I well, then, well, then we go back to the original recommendation is just do 50% um, now and then look at 50% next yeah, year. Yeah, if we did the 15%, 50% or 50-50, yeah. <clears throat> I'd also suggest maybe putting uh, some, while we're at it, changing it, maybe building in something that allows for either an automatic uh, increase based on CPI every two years or just a, a biennial review, biennials every two years, right? Yeah, it's not every six months. Yeah, yeah. semi <laughs> semi annuals every six months. Thank you. <clears throat> Biennial uh, review that you know prompts staff to bring council a, a look at. Hey, do we need to incrementally increase it so that we don't get caught in this trap twenty years from now? Right. Um, any further discussion, Council Um Do you? Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm a person that's is more of the consumer than I am the somebody that is in the industry or, or does this all the time or for a living. More about, I said, you know, that, that kind of weekend kind of person that walks, goes through this process and honestly doesn't do it a lot. They're just not that familiar with it. Um, is there anything, or do you have anything in your, in your office or that you give them that's like, this is who we are, this is what we do, and we're here to help, as opposed to just give me your money. Because when you walk in City Hall, it's kind of like <laughs> break your checkbook out. You know, I gotta pay you. You know, I'm trying to I'm trying to warm up the relationship a little bit with the people that you deal with on so, a not regular basis. The regular basis, that's a different kind of crowd. But on a on a, on a irregular basis, that's like, hey, we're actually here so to kind of help you. A right? couple and things. not just to kind of take your money and like a bank. Well, it's the, the bank I can get my money out of, you know. <laughs> so a couple, a couple things with that. One, you know, when we talk about time, staff time spent with, uh, with on each uh, application, you know, typically it's it's not uncommon at any point of the day for you to walk upstairs and see it, either Dave or anyone from the building inspections team out there, out in the front lobby, sitting with people, walking them through process, right. walking them through, you know, what are their responsibilities are, what our responsibilities are, and typically, you know, with the with the applications, with the permits, that you know, there is a step by step. You know, here's your responsibilities, here's our responsibilities. Mm -hmm. That's you know included. But it's, I'm I'm literally thinking to the, to the level of. You know, here's a little three-piece brochure that says this is this is what we do. This is who we are. We're here to help you. This is why we have to do it. Just a basic overview of um, to try to. It's PR. So uh, like it, building it codes PR. awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were actually talking about that last week. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah, we have <laughs> a needed. deck guide that we hand out if someone's building a deck that are kind of walk them through step by step. Right. Um, we have all kinds of different uh, handouts and brochures to kind of show someone start to finish if they're going to build a deck or even do a remodel or addition. Because I get, I mean, I have in the past. I don't. It doesn't happen a lot, but this does come up where like, hey, I had to pay that fee. You know, <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, really? So, I, I've had that. It, it, and I'm like, well, where did we go wrong in this? Because they're not understanding that it's actually, a, it's necessary that you do it and there's a reason why you do it. And so there's like a gap between them saying that to me and them, you know, paying the money. So we may try to close that a little bit. But you're gonna have to increase the fees to pay for the marketing. <laughs> I think uh, you're probably right. <laughs> a very simple baseline explanation that any of us can carry with us is, you know, we're we're here to make sure that your deck doesn't fall down on you. Right. As long as they know that. <laughs> that is the whole. It's the main purpose of what they do is making sure that whatever is built is built safely, built to code, and built in a way that you know you can be comfortable having your friends and family on it. I, I get it, but I don't, I'm not sure that the person, you know, that the person 
they don't always leave with that with that feel. And with homeowners, it always takes a little bit more time for the plan review process. We have to walk them step by step through it, and even on the inspection process, it's more you know back and forth with them trying to explain to them what's required. Mm -hmm. So it does take more time. Sure. Okay, so um, we have three more items. I know, just a quick question. Quick. I just wanna, yeah. <laughs> to follow up on what Councilor Sullivan said is when people come in, we're using the reference of the deck. And you are here representing the building code as the building official. What is in the process that allows zoning to check the box to make sure the deck is being built in accordance with zoning? Yes, it's a safe deck, but when zoning says you can't put that here after you spent twenty thousand dollars on it, that's in <laughs> that, that, that's part of the plan review process as right. well. So they're required to have the setbacks on there where the deck's going to be in relationship to the house and to the actual property, and those setbacks need to be on there as well. And that's part of the review. That's fee. part of the review. Yep. And that to me is extreme value added. Mm -hmm. If you're going to put an addition or a deck or major structure on your house to know that you can do it legally mm -hmm. and in compliance with zoning. Every permit goes through zoning for that reason. Okay. Good. I hope you don't want decks falling down on people. Okay. Um, so, um, um, so I need a motion. So are we fine with the 50% or? I mean, I'm certainly amenable to phasing it in. Yeah. I don't know that we were clear on how that's done though. So <clears throat> if there is a motion to move this forward, uh, directing staff to spread the increase out over two years uh, and include a biennial review uh, of fees, of related fees. But I think that's all the direction we would need at this point and we'll move it to council. Okay, I'd like to make that motion. I would make that motion that we forward this to council to increase the building permit fees uh, by 50% each over the next two years with a biannual review once fully implemented? Yes. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So that is approved and it's moved forward to the next council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. you all. The next item is the ordinance to amend and reenact section 29 through 11 of the Winchester City Code to amend the water rates for residential customers outside the city limits. Presented by Perry Eisenhower and Kelly Henshaw. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This seems like a really fast, quick one. <laughs> this will be the fastest one today. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, last December, council approved a new agreement with Frederick Water where they purchase water from the city. One of the provisions that is in that agreement that we agreed to is that we would change the water rates for residential customers outside of the city limits so that they would be the same as residential customers inside the city limits. So that's what this ordinance does. It does not change the commercial rates outside of the city limits. They will still be 50% higher than in the city. And there's a provision if for some reason in the future the agreement with Frederick Water goes away, we would come back to council at that time and increase rates for the residential customers outside the city limits. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions? So this is an action to say we're going to do what we said we were going to do? Correct. I have a uh, uh, <laughs> question. <laughs> I'll make a motion that we forward this to the council for, uh, with a recommendation for approval. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That has been forwarded with approval. Thank you. That was quick. The next item is a discussion on possible implementation of a stormwater utility. Possible implementation. I'd like to strike the word possible. We don't want to assume anything. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a discussion. <laughs> this 
This one probably won't be quite as quick. <laughs> but it can, we can we can move through it fairly quickly. Okay. And uh, so I, you know, a, a stormwater utility is something that has been talked about for many years. Um, why are we talking about it today? Well, I think in the last six months especially, there have been numerous development proposals that have come to City Council. And one of the common themes is stormwater issues and existing stormwater problems that we have out in the community that we have not been able to address because we've never had the funding available to do that. So a big component of our capital improvements, flooding issues, maintenance issues that exist today that we would like to address. The second part of the equation is um, regulatory requirements. So the city has a stormwater permit that Kelly administers. She's the expert on all that. We have to meet certain requirements in that permit, especially related to Chesapeake Bay requirements. Over the next six years, there is a lot we are going to have to do. And it's going to cost money to do that. Kelly will talk a little bit more about that. The third piece of the puzzle is the maintenance of our system. We have a fair amount of stormwater infrastructure. We don't have nearly as much as we need, but we do have quite a bit of infrastructure and it only is getting older and more difficult to maintain. So that's another, another item. The way that we operate today, there is some money from um, the Highway Maintenance Fund, money we get from the state for our roads that goes towards stormwater maintenance. Um, but the majority of the large capital projects, really the general fund will have to fund those based upon today without a dedicated revenue source for stormwater projects. So let's talk about the capital projects first. There, We've got multiple projects going on right now. Valley and Tevis, the Hope Drive project. Um, those are big projects with a lot of stormwater components. The next big project that we will do will be the North Cameron drainage project. We hope to start construction on that by the summer of 2023, next year. We have a lot of known projects throughout the city. Um, we have about a list of what, 50, 50 projects that we're looking at 50 plus million dollars. And we're currently putting together cost estimates for each of those projects and priorities so that we can bring council a list of Here's the, here's the projects, here's how we recommend they be prioritized. We can't do 50 projects all at once, we don't have $50 million all at once. But this map here shows you each dot on the map is a project. A proposed project or a project? A, project? a, a proposed, Okay. A, a project that we know is needed. Okay. To address a stormwater issue. It's a lot of blue dots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a lot of. There's there's a bit huge need out there. So, the maintenance of our system right now the maintenance falls on the streets division in public works. There are eleven employees in streets. One supervisor, 
two street sweepers. So that leaves us two four person crews. They're responsible, one crew for the most part is dedicated to maintaining the streets and alleys, the asphalt maintenance. The other four person crew is dedicated primarily to maintaining sidewalks and curb and gutter, the concrete. Um, there are a lot of other things that come up during the year that we pull from those crews to do. One of, that, one of those is stormwater. Unfortunately, we, we would really like to have a crew dedicated to stormwater system maintenance. It, it's really needed just like we have for our water and sanitary sewer systems. We have dedicated crews. We do not have that here. And so our maintenance is very reactive. When there's a problem that comes up, we go address it. We just don't have the ability to be proactive today like we would like to be. So we've talked about that. Um, you know, the system keeps aging. We're, we're adding more capital improvements. These stormwater management ponds that we're building, that's gonna require more maintenance. Um, we estimate that the cost to add a dedicated stormwater crew would be about $400,000 a year. So the second piece of the puzzle is regulatory requirements related to Chesapeake Bay. So Kelly, take it from here. All right. <laughs> so um, in the early 2000s, EPA decided that the Chesapeake Bay was in really bad shape, and they took a look at it, and um, we're looking at three key pollutants, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. And they took the whole drainage area for the bay, divided it up by the states, and then said to the states, now you divide it up by all the localities that drain to the bay. So that's how we ended up, because we are permitted through DEQ with this waste load allocation that we have to reduce over a period of 15 years. It started in 2013, and um, by 2028, we're supposed to meet 100% of this waste load reduction. Uh, Unfortunately, the way they broke it out, so they put benchmarks in there. The first five years, we only had to meet a 5% reduction. So we did that mainly with our street sweeping program. Um, coming up in 2023, we have to do an additional 35%. And then by 2028, we have to do the rest, the other 60% to get to that 100. We grabbed that low hanging fruit at the beginning to meet those, those initial benchmarks. And so now we're facing some more uh, serious deadlines for these waste load allocations. Uh, we're really excited that the new Hope Drive Pond is going to be coming online in the next 60 days probably. That facility treats over 300 acres of urbanized area that really doesn't have any treatment now. It barely makes a dent in what mm. we have to do. So it just kind of shows you what the scale we're looking at for stormwater treatment uh, citywide to be able to hit, hit our goals. And one of the way, you know, we're, we're looking at what's the best plan to, to meet these regulations. We have the ability, like other localities do, there's a, a system where you can purchase nutrient credits. There's an open market out there. And so you can buy these credits that would achieve the, the permit requirements. They're not cheap. Um, but it may, we may have to do some of that in the coming years to, to meet these regulations. So, who do you buy these credits from? There are nutrient banks set up throughout the state and actually all the base states, and they basically do projects on private lands where people have said, hey, do a nutrient credit bank, and then they sell those credits that are generated to localities or even private projects that need. Yeah, but does the money go to the state or the DEQ or? It, it goes to the landowner that did the improvements to begin with. Oh, oh, I see, okay, okay, yeah, okay. 
I didn't, I didn't. But. Okay, so let's uh, talk about the mechanics of the stormwater utility. So the way it would be set up is that all properties in the city that have impervious surface, water runs off roofs, driveways, parking lots, what have you, would be assessed a fee based upon how, how much area of impervious surface they have. So it, obviously if you have a, a big property with a big parking lot, you have a lot of storm water that runs off of it, you're going to pay more than a, resident, a residential property owner that has a small house. But every property in the city would be assessed this fee. It would operate very similarly to the way that our water and sewer utilities operate. It would be self-supporting, meaning that all the revenues that would be collected would have to be used for stormwater related issues. There are currently 31 localities in Virginia that have a stormwater utility. The last time we talked about this was 2018. At that time, there were 25. So in the past three years, there's been six additional localities. And you can see this is what their residential, their average residential rate is for the 31 localities. It's an average monthly rate of $8.20. But there's a big, huge range. Because you can see, for example, the city of Alexandria, they're at about $23 a month. So there's, there's a huge range. And all these, all these localities are in the Chesapeake Bay watershed that are, some of them just have them that are? Not all of them. Galax is far west of that. Oh, yeah. It doesn't drain, but most of them, yes. Yeah. And I would say all of them, um, I think almost all of them are permitted the same way that the city is. So if, if we were to, if council were to approve it and we would implement a stormwater utility, and let's say that we would set the rate so that the average residential rate is $5 a month. that would generate about $1.2 million a year based on the data we had from 2014. Because back then, we looked at every property, every commercial property in the city to determine how much impervious surface they had. And we just made an estimate for residential properties. Um, I think if we would move forward, we would look at every individual property including residential properties. We think that that's really the fairest, most equitable way to do it. Instead of, you know, some places they'll just set a, a flat fee for residential properties. And that could be done. But it's hard to explain the equity for that for somebody that has a small house, 1,000 square feet. Why are they paying the same amount as a house that might have 5,000 plus square feet. So that's just one of the things to think about. But with that amount of revenue, 1.2 million a year, that would allow us $400,000 to add this maintenance crew. And it would leave about $800,000 a year for capital improvements we would be able to borrow about nine or $10 million to do capital projects. It would support that level of debt service. And I think ultimately, the rate over time is going to be driven by how many capital improvements we do. The more projects we do, the more the rate would need to go up. So back in 2014, 
this was the list of the 20 um, properties with the most impervious surface and what their monthly and annual bill would be. So the medical center, the, they would be the largest customer. Obviously, there's been a lot of development since 2014, so all these numbers would need to be updated. So if council wants to move forward with the stormwater utility, from your end of things, it's pretty straightforward. You would adopt an ordinance establishing stormwater utility and you would set what the, what the fee is. There's a lot of work behind the scenes that we would need to do. Um, we would need to look at every property in the city to, do, to calculate the amount of impervious surface. That would take, we think, six to eight months. We would recommend that we would actually not start billing for 10 months to a year after council adopts the ordinance to give people time so they can prepare for it, especially the large commercial customers. And it's, it's going to take us that amount of time to get it all into the billing system. Um, there's a lot of details that, that we would need to work out. If council were to move forward with that now, we would, in the FY24 budget, is when we would actually be billing, and with the improved maintenance, with the maintenance crew, and actually start these capital projects. So. the options that we've laid out for council for, for you all today. You could direct us to prepare an ordinance and bring it back. We would be more than happy to do that. We can continue discussions. If you need more information, if you want us to have a, a discussion with the full council, we're happy to, we're happy to do that. <coughs> or, um, there's no appetite to move forward with this right now. Well, they kick the can down the road again and again. Yes. <laughs> Till we can't kick it anymore. No. Till we're drowning. <laughs> Till you get into the storm sewer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Councilor Sullivan, you're ready and geared up. I am. I'm locked in. I got a lot of questions. Um, I guess. You didn't answer some of them that I had written down, so I appreciate that. Um, I guess, what if a, one of these large landowners just decided to make their own stormwater pond or reduce their surface area to, in order to reduce their bill? I mean, is that a foreseeable, that could happen? It could. Um, a lot of the stormwater utilities have a system of credits so that if a property goes above and beyond what they have to do, they could get a, a credit on their stormwater bill. Mm -hmm. So the yes. that, how is that done? Is that, is that, I mean. So let's just assume a new project comes forward and they have certain standards that they have to meet just to meet city code. If they then said, okay, well, we only have to remove this much phosphorus, but we're going to remove this much phosphorus because we're going to build a much bigger facility. Well, the facility being the water pond. Treatment. It could be pond. It could be underground storage. It could be rain gardens. It, that really is up to them how they'd like to approach it. But I think they would just need to demonstrate that they have exceeded the expectations. Um, but we would evaluate that through the plan review process. I think there probably would be a process as part of the billing calculations um, because we do have a lot of properties that already have stormwater facilities 
most just get the bare minimum to get their approval. But just what to I could see people coming forward and saying, hey, what if we went above and beyond and did this? Could we get this? Well, it, it leads to a larger um, pattern that I've that it's just human nature to do that. I mean, that's that's just where it is, where um, you're going to try to reduce your cost. What's the nature of, um, how public is the information where somebody can go look up and say, oh, well, you know, Mr. Sullivan's property is 85% non-permeable. What is that? We don't have a layer available for public GIS right now, mm -hmm. but as we, would. we develop that, that will definitely be something. Harrisonburg has an excellent example of what they've done, and it's out there. They want people to go mm -hmm. and look at their property and say, if you don't think this is right, please contact us and we'll do an audit on it and make sure. I agree with that. I so is that something, tagging on to this, is that something that if the council has an appetite for this, would that, would that GIS study be included into all of this? The, 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 the mapping? Yes. Yeah. We, yes. We've actually already been talking with GIS to try to get the ball rolling. So okay. Yes. Here. I just got two more. Than yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. Turn yeah. back over. Yeah. I, I did, your map is intriguing and it has a lot of projects on it. Um, and I know that there's there's areas in my neighborhood that, that there's areas in all of the city that, that have issues. I mean, I would need to see the top 10 list and the timeline. And then I would have to also be comfortable with the fact that when you, everybody starts chucking in the money, they're going to want to start seeing the results. And this right. whether almost whether or not these you have your first four laid out or whatever, you're going to get to a situation where it's going to have to be balanced by ward, geographically, ward wise, whatever. So people are not feeling like they're paying for something that they're not getting. Um, I think that's really important. Um, and then the other one is I don't know we I don't know our timeline it's probably not good but if this goes to um, a discussion at the retreat <clears throat> or we're gonna the retreat agenda is about an 80 90 percent set but there's a pretty big portion of it that's uh, about housing and we can incorporate some discussion of this. Okay. Um, improvement. It's probably best, I mean, that list you're talking about, Perry and his crew are working on now, it's the prioritized list. We don't anticipate that that list will be ready until the end of this year. End of this year. So it might be more for a discussion <coughs> of all, you know, work session or something like that once we actually have the, the prioritized list. Um, okay. In place. Yeah, I would. I would definitely need that, and then I would need reassurance that there's no way uh, for an entity to claim a certain status and get out of no, get no. out of having to pay. Because this is a, a fee and not a tax, mm -hmm. um, everybody will be subject to it. So you see, top of the list is I mean, Winchester Medical. Currently, is tax exempt, uh, so it wouldn't it wouldn't be treated the same way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and towards that, I noticed also the city of Winchester is on the, is one of the items, and school board is one as well. Correct. So would this actually be something that they would be assessed as well? We pay ourselves now. Yes. Right. Okay. Awesome. Um, so that answers kind of my first question of because most of this is related to improved real estate. Um, why is it? Why are we trying to uncouple it from the real estate tax? And I see that because of the tax exempt status. Um, when you do get to that, the list of your 50 and then you prioritize, I think it would be helpful for us to have an understanding of what was your basis of prioritization. Oh, you sure. Know, whether it's, um, whether it's, Councilor Sheldon said, kind of geographic distribution, whether there's potential liability to the city in one over the other pending or potential damage to property, whatever that might be, so that there's almost like a, a, a rubric of how you came up with it, not just uh, these five look good. Right. Um, yeah. I like the idea of a dedicated crew because it is a, it's a skill set, it's a, it's a, uh, a, a equipment set uh, that people are going to want to uh, be familiar with and also kind of in a building of an institutional knowledge of 
we got to go back and hit this every five years because of the following. So I think that's helpful, and I'm definitely in support of moving us towards that. Um, the impervious square footage, you know, the implication is you're using kind of like photometric survey or aerial survey for that. Um, will people, in addition to maybe making above the normal requirements for their stormwater, either detention or, or treatment, if they've got evidence of cisterns, rain barrels, pervious pavers instead of impervious pavement, are those things that would be looked at, or is that things that would be, if you've got it, bring it to our attention? It's going to be tough to go out and evaluate every property in the city. It is. And some localities do that, where if a homeowner has a rain barrel or something, they can get a, a little bit of break on their stormwater bill. Mm -hmm. But that increases the administration mm -hmm. of the program. Right. To, to keep up with all of that. So you, you kind of balance. But it's, you know, ultimately I think that would be council's discretion how. Well, I think what, as, as Kelly was saying, you, you want to, I don't know if reward is the right word, is acknowledge, incentivize. Um, and we think in terms of larger scale development, but, you know, um, you know, a large cistern or some other in-ground detention on a small residential property can be just impact, as impactful on a per square foot basis. So I think the idea of incentivizing whoever the property owner is to go above and beyond is beneficial because it's, it's kind of incentivizing the solution and not necessarily viewing this exclusively as a revenue stream. It's, we're trying to solve a problem. We need the revenue to help solve the problem. But if you can participate in it, then we can, you know, we all make out, we all win. So I would say that's that's certainly something we'd want to be factored in. How does this is this a separate bill to each improved property? Is this tacked to the water and sewer? It it would be added to the water and sewer bills. Okay. Um, the, for single family residential, that's pretty straightforward. For most commercial properties, that's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. But there, there are instances where, you, let's say you have a duplex or threeplex and there's separate water meters, mm -hmm. we would have to get with the property owner okay. to, to um, you know, if, if the water and sewer are in the tenant's names, how we would need to work through that. Okay. And then how would you also handle whatever size property that was vacant and had no, no water service to it, but still had, you know, 10,000 square feet of parking lot? We would, they would, they would get a, a new bill. So okay. we would add them into the utility billing system and they would get a, a stormwater bill. Okay. Without, without attached sewer water, solid waste collection. Correct. Just, Yes, utility bill. Yep. Okay. You know, I, I think as far as you guys clearly have thought this through, just making sure it's fair, equitable, enforceable, and not an, an administrative, an undue administrative burden. Um, no, they wouldn't do that. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh, we just asked them not to. <laughs> if, my, if I may. Uh, one good thing is that we've got 30 plus jurisdictions to to draw from, so yeah. we're not, we, we won't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, one thing that I, I do want to clarify, when, we, when staff brings you the prioritized list, it will not be based on geographic distribution. Uh, we will calculate it based on need uh, and condition of uh, <clears throat> the surrounding area, as well as the impact of that particular project. Uh, when you start, similar to repaving roads, you know, when you start artificially distributing it, it becomes a little bit political. Uh, it's the council's criteria discretion. Right. If, if we bring you a list of here's the, here's the 50 top projects, it could be that the top eight of the top 10 are in a relatively right, right, right. You know, <laughs> contained area because, but that'll be because our, our experts have said, this is a project that needs to happen and it has, does the greatest good. Councils obviously, you know, 
it's your discretion if you want us to throw in a factor that does you know weight distribution a little bit. That's your also discretion. I think one thing we have come up well, a blessing and a curse is that we have so many projects. I'm sure it will not be problematic to get them everywhere. I don't think anybody is going to miss out on uh, on this by any stretch. In fact, they'll probably get more annoyed by all of the uh, construction happening because it will be around roads uh, in large part. So you'll see a lot of people wondering why we're doing so much road work. Well, it's going to be a lot of stormwater uh, work for the foreseeable future, especially if we're able to borrow $10 million to mm -hmm. get a jump start on that $50 million bill. Did you have another? Just, I, I think one, I mean, you, you're in the process of education, educating <coughs> a committee of the full council, um, educating the entire community in advance of this, I think it's gonna be beneficial, um, you know, cause you can just hear people, you know, we've already heard the label, the rain tax. Um, but, you know, I think if you express the value and the benefit of the need to um, and why it's being structured the way it is. If you do it as an increase on in real estate tax, there are those who will participate, and some of those might be large property owners. So, kind of laying out the kind of the rules of engagement of how we might want to approach this, recognize that this isn't approved. I mean, it's not anything we've, we've stated, but I think. Who knows, this conversation may prompt an article in the newspaper. If Brian's listening, I'm sure he is. Um, He'll grab onto the rain tax. Did yes. I say that? <laughs> I didn't mean that. Um, okay. That's all right. Yep. Yep. All right. <laughs> Four years ago, we had this conversation. And had the conversation many years prior to that. And four years ago, I remember saying, I'm really tired of kicking this can down the road. Each year, um, the flooding gets worse. Last summer, <clears throat> I saw you know, people sent me um, videos of streets being flooded, people in the streets, um, basements getting water into them. That happens to us a lot. We just spent $14,000 just trying to prevent water from coming into our kitchen. And um, this is April. We're going into May and we're gonna, this, we're gonna see this stuff again. And if we don't do something about it now, it's just gonna get worse. And it's gonna start eroding things away. So whatever, like, if you start on something in a couple of years, then you're just you're gonna have to catch, play catch up to stuff that should have been done a while ago. I'm looking at this map <clears throat> of all these wonderful blue dots, my favorite color. And <clears throat> if you're standing, let's say, if you're standing on Loudon Street and you look like downtown on Loudoun Street, and you look to the right up uh, Loudoun Street, and you can see where um, almost at the top of the hill, and then you look um, north and south of each side, you can see where that, that water is like gonna be coming down. And looking at this map, you can see in all directions where that water is gonna focus. And then if you are on Whittier Lane and then you, um, you're living with Whittier Avenue and you see where that water comes down. And I know we have a stormwater drain pond over there and there, people that live over there, they just watch it fill up. But um, it does its job, but it only does it to a degree. And then there's runoff of that. And, Scalvin Street, Scalvin and Washington Street, oh my gosh. I'm surprised this street still exists. <laughs> but that's the old water street that just comes down here. So we need to do something. What I would suggest, and this is a suggestion, is that you come back to council with the resolution and also with, do you think that that top 10 list could that, that wouldn't be ready for a while. No, that'll, that'll be a little while. Uh, 
we, we know, I think in general terms, I'd hate to, I'd hate to stick to that list or put a list out there and have people start building expectations. Right, right. It, so. Well, I would like to see a resolution come to council because this is something that has to be done. And, um, and our residents know that it has to be done. I don't know how many people have um, um, had their basements damaged because of it. And I know that insurance, um, your insurance policy only covers things above ground, not in your basement. And so um, if people put in new basements and call their man caves or whatever they have, it gets washed out. But they're not going to recoup any funds from that. So I would like to see something come back to council. Um, so. so I can suggest that if the committee wants to forward this on to full council, uh, just direct staff to bring in a draft ordinance to council. Uh, I would suggest, because this is going to require some education uh, from the rest of council, that mm -hmm. rather than having it jump directly to a regular agenda, that we do a work session with full council with the ordinance, answer questions, and then after that, I mean, it's we'll be ready to, to start work pretty quickly uh, after that with the intent of bringing back the complete list later this year. For something like that, I wouldn't want to do it um, the second meeting in April because you're doing your budget. Yeah, we can do it in May. Does that, would that work? Okay, would that work for you all? That's it would. What, um, I mean, he had mentioned a delay between implementation and actually starting to collect. There's a lot of things that have to happen before yeah. we start collecting money. Um, one of those is the formula upon which the fee is based. Is we, we don't have that ready yet. Yeah. That would be part of the discussion. That's so that would come yeah. up in this work session. So that gives them a little bit more time. Yeah. To, to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think going to work session is yeah. probably the best direction from here. Yeah. If we can get a motion. Well, if I could also just, I think it'd be helpful. You've got the 31 communities in the city state do it I think kind of ranking not ranking them but identifying those that are have similar conditions or issues and what what kind of incentive programs they have in place basically cherry pick uh, the opportunities we have here uh, because I think those want to be considered as part of the ordinance yes um, mm -hmm. but if you were looking for a motion to forward this to the council for a future work session yes all right, because this is just a discussion item. At this well, point. this is a discussion item, but we want to see a draft resolution. Ordinance. No, sorry, why do I keep calling it resolution? A draft, because ordinance. a draft ordinance, please. Thank you. At the, at the work session? Yes. Okay, that's the motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you all. Thank you. Let's keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> All right, last but not least, uh, February 2022 budget summaries, Celeste Broad Street. Harry's going to help me? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so this will be quick, unless you guys have questions. So, yes, good afternoon again, Council yeah, Mayors. Um, so this is a budget summary from July 1st um, through February 28th. Um, that's 67% of the budget year. So you can see for revenues, we're at 61.8% 61 .8 of the budget. Keep in mind that uh, two of our large revenue sources don't come in until after this time period, the business license we talked about earlier, and then the second half of real estate. So that's why that number's a little low. And But our expenditures are still lower than the 67% at 64.6%. Um, you can see sales tax, um, meals, motel tax, they're all still trending up. Um, your sales tax is up 16% from this period last year. Um, you can see the um, November sales tax in 2020 was 1 million 102, and this um, December 2021 is 1 million 271, so that's still trending up. Um, the January sales tax came down. Of course, we expect January usually is lower, about 854,000. 
expenditures are all, like say we're on track um, below to come in with budget still projecting like we showed that slide earlier projecting to have an unassigned fund balance at the end of the year well you know just close to our 25 percent of our policy so and we are and that does include projecting to use about 1.5 million this year of fund balance so if we um, i'm projecting a surplus of around 600,000. so if we didn't have we weren't using the fund balance it'd be closer to two million dollars of revenues over expenditures so um, with that i'd be happy to answer any questions that you have or Questions? Comments? Questions. Celeste, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you very thank you much. Guys. Appreciate it. All right, have a good day. I will now entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are now adjourned. Okay. Thank you.